You're listening to Purpose, Leadership, and Peak Performance, an Optimal Living interview with Brian Johnson and the CEO of the Detroit Pistons, Dennis Mannion. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Dennis Mannion, a new friend who is the CEO of the Detroit Pistons, uh, one of the major sports teams out here in the U.S. for those internationally. Um, and Dennis and I connected uh, when he became a member of our program. I, I often look at the new members and I happen to see the Pistons or Pistons.com as the URL. And I said, that's pretty cool. Let's check that out. Did a quick search and Dennis Mannion, the CEO of the Pistons, with an extraordinary background, having served at an executive level in the four major sports uh, organizations, currently the NBA, in the past, uh, Major League Baseball, the president of the Dodgers, uh, and then the NFL and the NHL as well. And just a really cool story. We hit it off and connected. And as I was preparing for my upcoming class on peak performance, I reached out to Dennis and said, hey, I'd love to to, uh, to chat and to share some of your wisdom as uh, I get prepared, and I'm sure our audience will love it. So that's a long prelude. But Dennis, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, just thrilled to chat. Well, me too, Brian, and I'm uh, obviously a, a big a member and a big fan of, of yours. I think that what you're doing is absolutely amazing for all of us that have um, aspirations or are already involved in any form of leadership to be able to synthesize so many great ideas and then also have um, an opportunity to, to uh, purchase the great work that people have done. It's, it's thrilling for me. I, I am an absolute fanatic about uh, self and team development. So um, I just want to thank you before we get started. Right on. Uh, that means a lot. And uh, in our first emails, you, you mentioned that you felt like a kid at a sporting goods store. <laughs> I, thought, yeah, I did. I, my, my wife said, what are you doing? You know, you think of very few days off, you're spending the entire time on your computer. And she said, you can't have that many emails. I said, no, I found a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'm honored to be part of your life. And uh, let's jump into uh, to your wisdom. So I want to start with your story. Um, you know, when I learned more about you and just, just looked at what you've done, it's just so cool, you know, to have created a career in which you're, uh, you've played such a role in um, each of these these sports organizations. I just want to hear about your backstory and how you discovered, I, I assume you feel like you're living on purpose and doing what you're here to do and um, doing it in a really cool way and just how you how you discovered that or stumbled upon it or created it or how you would describe that. Well, it's, it's been an amazing journey and I'll, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. I had always been a sports fanatic. I played baseball, football, and basketball. I grew up in Pittsburgh, you know, a Steeler fan and a Pirate fan and a Penguin fan as well. And very, very into sports, and um, I ended up going to the University of Pittsburgh. And I was studying economics, and I had I'd been playing baseball, and I had a, a, a shoulder surgery followed by a um, by some elbow surgery. So I was in a sling for the first two years there. And it just happened that I had been in an English literature class two year two years in a row with the same dean of the English department. And he came up to me at one point. He said, man, you've had that uh, sling on for a long time. And I laughed. I said, I've had two different surgeries. He said, what are you, what are you doing here at Pitt? And I said, I'm studying econ. And he said, you must be a jock if you're always getting operated. And I said, well, I play baseball, but I think that's over now. And this was the most amazing thing. This was 1978. And he said, did you ever consider you know, studying sport management? And I said, I wish there was such a thing. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, a friend of mine is the dean of the sport management program up at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and uh, they're just starting an undergrad program. Uh, Ohio University and UMass always had grad programs, but UMass is going to have the first undergrad program. And he said, would you ever be interested in transferring there? And I said, in a heartbeat. So he made a call for me, and they said, look, we're only taking nine out of the 90 picks that we make from out of state, so if you want to come up, come up. And uh uh, amazingly, I jumped in my little rabbit and my little blue suit and went up and interviewed with 13 of the faculty members, got into UMass, uh, literally went there my junior year, uh, and then halfway through my senior year, you get to do an internship for the second half of your senior year, and uh, the UMass guys, the professors there were so fantastic, they were dedicated to getting me placed you know, with one of the teams in an internship. As it turned out, I was three for three with Major League Baseball, the Atlanta Braves, but most importantly, the Philadelphia Phillies. 
And that's where it all began in 1981, in December of 81. I interviewed with a fellow by the name of Dave Montgomery, who's now a general managing partner um, of the Phillies. And uh, Dave hired me uh, full-time on the spot, which was just a total gift. And the lucky part of it, Brian, was I deeply loved sports and loved numbers and loved creative energy. And the Phillies at that point were in the forefront of database before there were even databases. So it was super cool to work in an environment where it was a learning environment, very open, and I got to do everything. I got to work in broadcasting, ticket sales, promotions, uh, retail sales, the whole nine yards. So my freshman year of business, 20 to 30 years old, spent at the Phillies, I was learning basically all the tools of the trade on the business side of sports. And what was super cool for me, I think that's a big growth at time for people. You're not really sure what your purpose is, but it became apparent to me that I had two great skills. One was a very, very creative and also very organized. And combining them to do, together, I realized how many people we could make happy, especially at a sporting event. And uh, everything from creating concourse exhibits where fans could come and do speed pitch or hit you know, the, your favorite superstar's bat to, uh, you know, basically going in the upper deck and upgrading seats. It was a real turn on. I thought, man, there's such terrific power in this. I can keep being creative, keep creating inventories and just be organized enough to execute. This is going to be a great career. And as it turned out, I ended up spending 15 years at the Phillies and ran all the marketing and sales. And then I got recruited to be the COO of the uh, Colorado Avalanche and the uh, Denver Nuggets. And then um, three years after that, the Enterprise sold and uh, reconnected with an old friend and went to the Baltimore Ravens as a head of business ventures. And we won the Super Bowl the second year I was there and stayed there about eight years and was hired to be the president of the Dodgers and then from the Dodgers to be the CEO of uh, Palace Sports Entertainment and the Pistons. (laughs) That is awesome. Um, just to recap some of the highlights as I was listening and taking some notes, um, I love the fact that it kind of started with an anti-fragile moment, right? If you thought you're going to play baseball, get the surgeries, boom, you're out there, realize there's something more, you know, and then that mentor supporting you the way that he did. And it sounds like you've had a ton of support, um, obviously throughout, but particularly in that formative stage. And then you going for it, right? Being willing to go and actually pursue that and then connecting it to service and seeing, okay, I love this. I'm pretty good at it. And there's a way to really give value to the world. That's such a cool arc of a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about Purpose 101. Well, I appreciate that. And it's so, it's so special in that when I, when I think about bringing people together and throwing them, I take the eye out of it because um, I don't really get off on myself being mentioned. Often I'd upgrade people and I still do it without telling them who I am. It's just some, there's something inside your spirit that tells you, hey, this is a great way to make someone's day or maybe a lifetime memory. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been very fortuitous to be in an environment where you can really, you know, help a charity group out or help a family or a business even uh, have some of the most memorable moments of their life. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, when you look back over the arc of your career and you had to identify, or if you had to identify kind of the number one thing that you think led to the success that you've experienced, what would you describe that as? Well, I would say the number thing was the discovery of, of my personal talents, uh, which included, as I mentioned, um, you know, some cr- creative skills in terms of creating um, inventories and things that would turn on our fan base. And then secondly, the ability to to be organized and create an order. So for me, um, the, the, the highlight was figuring out that, hey, I can deliver a vision. And um, armed with that, I could deliver a ton of mini visions en route you know, to the bigger vision. And that was really the, the, the uh, starting point for me to really catch fire. Hmm. And was there a process that you went through to get that? Or was that more of kind of an ad hoc, huh, I'm pretty good at this. How would you describe that? Um, I w- that's a great question because it, it, it was, um, Discipline by discipline, um, whether it be ticket sales or broadcasting uh, or, or even game entertainment, in each of those disciplines that I was involved in, breaking it down and making it better, um, it, it was constant self-discovery and, and, and reinventing the approach that I would take. So I, I'd love to say it was ad hoc, but I also think that I'm just a structure-oriented person. So I got in this rhythm of... Uh, creating a vision and then a supporting order for it 
And, and then eventually, as I started to lead, I, I started to think about, I want to provide an ideology or a map of trust for people to, for our employees to understand where I'm going with things. And all those, those three elements added up to tons of opportunities. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to talk more about your leadership strategy in a moment, because I know you're so passionate about that. And we chatted a bit about that before. Um, before we go there, though, I want to just check in on any mistakes you might have made that were kind of the formative learning experiences that really helped shape everything and, and all that good stuff. Well, hundreds of them, because everything's <laughs> on a stage. And um, the, the most humorous of them that I, I could tell you is that um, we had a, a, a promotion one night called, uh, it was called Jamaica Night, and it was at the ballpark in Philadelphia, and we put balloons out all over the field, and only one of the balloons would have uh, car keys for a car out in center field. And uh, we had it on the scoreboard, and the fans ran out. There were four of them, I think, and they were popping all these balloons, and the fans, were, uh, fans in the stands were getting really excited. You know, who's going to pick these keys up? And after every balloon was popped, there were no keys. <laughs> <laughs> The owner of the team and the president of the team turned just, they both were staring at me. And then all of a sudden on the scoreboard, they saw, they saw one of the ground crew guys run back out and inadvertently it was caught on the scoreboard, dropped the keys onto the, onto no. the ground for someone to scramble the gravel. So the round of boos that uh, came around was unbelievable, but even better, as the car circled through the infield, people were throwing things, Cokes and whatnot, hot dogs out onto the field. Uh, okay, let's see if I have a job tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, one of the fun things I do with my son now, who's three and a half, is we talk about mistakes and, you know, Carol Dweck style and growth mindset of, of mistakes happen, you know, and, and it's and he now says it's part of the learning process. And then I, I now ask him, well, what did you learn <laughs> with that mistake? So what did you learn in that one? Well, it's, I, I've listened to you before talk about that. And, and you know, it's funny when I think about the things that um, – we all garner um, from a, a collective energy, from the, you know, the, this kind of universe where it's a creative universe where we're all learning from each other. One of the big things for me is just how lucky I've been in terms of being nurtured by people and overcoming uh, fear of failure because I've generally been taken care of by the leadership that I've been involved with. Even my parents were, were big on um, nurturing you through your failures. And so I never really felt that pang of extreme fear of failure. Maybe in the beginning when I started doing public speaking, but, you know, it, it dissipated over time. That's awesome. Well, let's, let's talk about, uh, let's go to leadership, and then I want to talk about athletes. Um, when you work with your team now, how do you help create a culture in which that uh, healthy fearlessness and willingness to take risks and embrace mistakes and failure is, is part of what you're up to? I think, Brian, the key thing, it's, for me anyway, it's all about clarity. So, you know, vision, uh, clearly everyone wants to know what the vision is and, and that vision needs to ring with everybody in a way that they feel like they have a purpose-filled job. But then the second step is to create the positions on the team, if you will, that will support the vision. And that's where it starts to get fun because on the business side, you know, we look at it as, you know, there's a group of creative people and a group of operationally driven people, a group of influential people, the sales group, and they're all encircled by what I call the straight-A students, you know, finance, legal, HR, and IT. And they make those three wheels roll, you know, the influencers and the, and the creatives and the, um, and the operations people. And so what I attempted to do here in, in was, was create a system where you knew exactly what your role was and even though your personality type was entirely different from someone else, you're almost forced to collaborate. That's kind of communication with friction on a regular basis. And the overarching reason not to fear uh, failure is that everyone's involved in the group effort. So everybody's playing a role in the, in the creation and the uh, execution and the sale of everything that we do. Uh, not that different from game planning in football where you take your offense, your defense, and your special teams, but they all had to be integrated around that game plan or you'd have a losing effort. So um, I, I, think that, I think that's where you were getting at. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And let's step back on a, on a broader level. One of the books that I still need to read that you recommended, and I think it's, it's on your favorite list, is Team of Teams. Is that right? Yeah, yes. T tell us, yeah, tell sure. us what you loved about that. Give us the uh, philosopher's notes on that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that book for me 
showed that, you know, in the military had traditionally been, you know, set up in these hierarchical structure, command and control, top down. And then um, in, in a very humble way, General McChrystal outlined for everybody how um, the, the, some of the, the um, interaction we had in the, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, how we were beaten to the punch every time because there was a randomness, sort of a systemized randomness to um, the uh, Iraqi um, insurgents. And he said, like, we were just too slow. And if you took the Rangers or if you took the SEALs or if you took the Special Forces, um, they all did exactly what they were told, but they weren't integrated in a way where they were collaborating on a real-time basis. So I loved at one point in the book, he takes the traditional org chart and then draws lines all over it where everybody's communicating to everybody. And for me, that was a major turn on in that book because he talks a lot about what we're into here, a lot about purpose and how that's the inspiration, but also spends a decent amount of time on creating a trust-based culture so that you can uh, collaborate freely without, uh, without feeling as though you might be burnt. Hmm. That's awesome, which goes back to that fearlessness, right, of the team is playing together, orchestrated as a whole. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, what else on the leadership front? Well, I think that the um, important thing is that there's two, two pieces to the team and uh, on the field, on the court, on the ice, and the team in the office here. It's, um, you know, one part of it is, is the individual, and you, you can't discount how important individuality is. And the second part of it, of course, is the collective effort of the team. So we break that into RISE on the, on, the, um, on the individual side, and that stands for realize, improve, share, and expand your individual talents. And then on the team side, we call it HALO, which is just to say high above life's obstacles, you have to work with others. And so this is all rooted in a set of um, values that we have that support individual behavior and a set of values we have that support teamwork. And uh, I think that that clarity drives forward, okay, look, this is how I can have, this is how I can be safe in my work environment or on the court or on the ice or on the field and at the, at the same time express myself. So um, that's, that to me is the, the real key to all this is just this business of rise and halo. And when it's all functioning, when the individuals are at their ebb and the team is operating in a systemized way where everyone's interacting appropriately, you move into this special space that we, we call LEAP. And uh, LEAP is an acronym for love, enthusiasm, appreciation, and peacefulness. And um, I'm thinking about changing the word peacefulness to playfulness, just because when it's fun, it's fun, you know? And, and I think peace is just something that's rooted all through it because of the clarity. So um, rise, halo, and LEAP is our, is our mantra. And then here, we, we separate all our floors. We've got our accelerators or the, the administrative team, the elators are the operational people, and, and then the relators are the salespeople, and the creators, of course, are all our commu- creative and communication folks. And the uh, igniters are our, our performers on the stage and on the court. Hmm. That's so cool. Um, amazing to imagine that integration throughout the organization and, uh, and also to, exciting to see that, how that kind of permeates down to the team level. How does the team just to speak very specifically about your domain, with the Pistons, how are they involved in that overall process, if at all? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I think Stan and I have, um, in, in, in previ- previously with the former general manager, Joe Dumars, in, in, the same thing. We're on parallel paths. We both believe that you've got to have, not to say that you want a team filled with players who have character, you've got to define what character actually means, and whether that means hard work and accountability and focus, proactivity, whatever it might be. Um, you've got to have a working definition. And then the key to it, to make it all gel, is that the players, they don't have to go out and socialize with each other after every game, but we are demanding that they have gratitude and appreciation for each other's talents because only then can you have a more explosive vision. I go back to Raven days when Rex Ryan was the defensive coordinator at the Ravens. He'd bring the defensive players, Ray Lewis and the rest of that group, in on Tuesdays to game plan with him because they'd have a more explosive vision because they'd know each other's talents and how they all could be rotated and used in efficient ways. And then when you have the big vision, obviously that leads to big passion. Big passion for us leads to, leads to faith and courage, which is totally necessary, especially when you go through losing streaks or injuries and things like that. And what I love about watching teams that gel 
you know, when they when they have character, they have gratitude for each other, vision, passion, faith, and courage. Uh, they move into this place they call it competitive spirit, and you'll see the swagger the team has. And for for example, would be our young, young, young team, one of the youngest in the NBA, uh, played its way into the last spot in the playoffs, but had to face the Cavaliers. And it was fun to watch them, uh, especially our 19-year-old Stanley Johnson, to watch him go out on the court with some competitive spirit and a swagger almost. And that's when you know, like, okay, you've arrived, when you've got that swagger. And then the last piece of it, of course, is you're always going to face defeat. We, we, we got swept in that series, and there's a sense of humility. And the humility with teams, it either feeds the character, which then feeds the whole wheel again, or they go a different way. And you know when you have a good team, if the team is humbled and they come back even stronger. Right on. All that is so inspiring with, with character as the base of that foundation and the engine for that swagger, right? Not an arrogance and a kind of flying away egotism, but just a deep, deep sense of character. I'd love to hear you. What's your definition of character? It, it's so interesting. I mean, to keep it simple, you know, for me, um, it's a set, of, a set of slogans we use, you know, so hard work, we say go hard or go home accountability and focus, we say focus, don't fold. Commitment, we say commitment over involvement. Uh, positive attitude, we say willpower over won't power. Uh, self-improver, we say uh, contribute to yourself, don't contaminate yourself. And as a team improver, be a fountain, not a drain. And lastly, um, on the proactive side of it, we say um, you know, uh, warriors win and, and, and fools react. And um, that's kind of our, our, from hard work down to proactivity. And we have three simple rules for teamwork. Um, always be authentic with each other, but re- be respectful about it. Uh, be resourceful, but be disciplined about being resourceful. And then lastly, um, uh, no victims and no villains. And that's the hardest one to enforce because everybody, you know, likes to get into that kind of the, the victim thing. Yep. And so um, that's, that's pretty much the definition of it. Wow, it's amazing. Let's just pull the thread on the last part of that. So then how do you navigate, particularly no victim part of it? You know what? It goes back to being authentic and respectful with people. So we have, for example, let's say we had a player who felt that they were stripped of um, some of the responsibilities that they had on the court. Um, I think Stan is very open and uses facts uh, to, to express why he's making the changes that he's making. We do the same thing, obviously, on the business side. If we have a deal maker, for example, that uh, we don't think is performing at a high level, we'll sit them down and go through, you know, the actual stats and then make corrective, uh, positive um, uh, changes in the way in which they're, in the way in which they're operating. And it's so interesting because you could basically go back to the, the seven or so um, pieces of definition of character that we have. And usually you can identify one, two, uh, up to three different things that they're, they're, they're failing on. So, uh, that's that's the basic uh, remedy. That's awesome, and then it's in a sense of empowerment, not the the demonizing them, right? Or uh, yes, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Great. It's just like uh, like we were talking earlier. It's like not about fear of failure. It's all about getting better and being the best you can be. Rise, right? rise, exactly. <laughs> Put on that halo and make the leap. I love it. Let's talk about athletes for a moment. So, having worked with some of the best athletes on the planet in their respective sports and overall. I'd just love to hear from you what you've seen differentiates the truly exceptionally elite with those who don't quite make it to that level. Have you noticed anything? Yeah, obviously in 35 years of doing this, I've, I've spent a lot of time, you know, analyzing winning and losing teams and winning and losing players. I hope this doesn't sound too complicated, but generally what I find um with the individual athlete, um, on, as an individual, so many of them are rooted to a higher source. Um, and it, it could use any number of higher sources they're rooted to, but generally God. And, uh, I think that, that, um, they're generally the second thing I run into is that they're, they have a, they're spirited. They've got sort of this sort of spiritual sense about them. And that to me seems to drive their free will the third thing. And with their free will, you know, we all have choices to to either do the hard thing or do the easy thing. And I've found with most of these athletes, um, they're pre-wired because of their commitment to to their higher source and their spirit to do the right thing for their mind and their body. And it's 
it's uh, an amazing thing because people look at professional athletes as these completely elite and entitled type of folks. And the reality is they're more like artists. They're special. They're different. They've got um, physical talents that are exceptional. But when you get to um, the major leagues, um, there's a whole different, whole different game there. It's so much more than just physical talent. And it gets into this, this business of them being able to create the world that they want to create. And so that's the individual part of it, you know, kind of this commitment to their, their, their inner source and their spirit and, and drive their free will in ways that productively help their minds and their bodies on the court ice or field. The other thing that's kind of interesting to me is that the really exceptional players that play well from, from a chemistry standpoint, same commitment to the universe at large, but um, they seem to find rhythms with people. They're like uh, almost like musicians, where they will play the rhythm to the you know to the to the other um, musicians. And and uh, I think uh, the other thing I've seen them too is that they have um, generally all of them have had somewhere along the line a coach or multiple coaches that they've they've had good good nurturing when they're good team players. And the biggest thing of all, they value companionship at a different level than most people. They live for that chemistry uh, with their teammates. I'm not saying all the players that way. I'm just saying the exceptional ones who become that heartbeat of the team, to me, that that's kind of the three or four things that they're, they're really into. That's amazing. And I just love your clarity and thoughtfulness and, and, uh, the frameworks with which you break these ideas down. I want to go back through that really quickly because uh, I found it really inspiring. Um, I've never made the connection between you're talking about the spiritual and the faith and something bigger than themselves, and that spirituality, that spiritual connection, led to them being spirited, right, and having that energy, which then fueled yeah. their their free will. It's interesting because the umbrella business that we run everything through is called Entheos Enterprises. Entheos, yeah. you know, the two little Greek words that make up enthusiasm god within and so i've always said you know that well you need god within in order to have that enthusiasm and theos leads to enthusiasm but i hadn't heard that and made the connection of the spiritual connection to be spirited right yeah um, and then interestingly like i for whatever reason happened to read an article on steph curry's faith and i thought it was just the coolest thing where he's he's obviously a devout christian but he made the point that he didn't think he needs to beat people with the Bible, that he just wants them to watch him play and say something's different about that guy. He's playing with yeah. a different spirit. And it gives me tears in my eyes right now, even as I say that. And when I shared it with my wife, I'm like, that is just the coolest demonstration of one spirituality I can imagine. You know, that there's some other thing working through us, um, working through him in this context that, that you can feel, you know, there's something special there. Um, and I just love your reflections on that being the essence of, of what you've seen differentiate the truly elite. It, it's amazing. And the greatest player though controversial on some level, the greatest player I've ever been around um, is Ray Lewis. And it's funny, inside his shoes, he was number 52, and inside his shoes it says 5 plus 2 equals God, number 7. And, uh, and Ray was um, 190% every single practice. It was like having a coach on the field. And I've never seen anybody more committed to, um, to, to his God. You know, and it's, it's a lot like Steph. And he didn't want to run around, you know, proselytizing. He, he was more like, you know, watch how I play. I play with full power all the time. I played with a separated shoulder in the last Super Bowl. It's amazing. Wow. Which leads us to one of the themes of, of all of my work of how do you arrive at that and express that deep connection to something bigger? And it's Arte, right? It's 190% doing your best moment to moment to moment. Let that be the demonstration and the expression um, and the reconnection to that that ultimate force. Uh, that is super inspiring. Um, anything else on there you want to share? No, I would just say kind of back at you with, with what you just said because I honestly think we all face so much diversity. It, everything depends on how you look at it. But um, in listening to a lot of the things that you've done, you tie it all back to the one expression. And uh, it's a big deal because I think what you're saying, you know, if you have high blood pressure, or you have heart disease, or whatever it might be, you know, you have an opportunity to, to, to be inspirational with yourself and, and take things to a new level. And that, that's what I love so much about the work you're doing I'm, you know, learning so much from so many of the amazing people that speak, but yourself, and, and especially because you're tying it all together so well. 
I really enjoy it. Well, again, I appreciate that. And, um, yeah, just excited to, to take that inspiration and, uh, and serve profoundly and, and uh, see what we can do over the long run and make a difference. I, I'd love to hear from you what specific, as you know, I'm all about the fundamentals, you know, those things that keep us plugged in and, and operating at a high level. How would you describe your fundamentals, the things that, that you've integrated into your life that have really made a difference? Well, it, it, you know, not dissimilar from the individual athlete. Like, I have a, I have a commitment. Um, mine is Christian, so I have an expression I use called calm, which is, you know, Christ always loves me. And uh, that fuels my spirit. It makes me feel like, okay, all right, this, this, and this haven't gone right. But I'm being watched. I'm, but there's an order to my life and a rhythm, and I've got to just listen. And um, it usually helps me make the right decision on a free will basis. And uh, that's affected me. Um, I love, 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 love when you describe the rituals that you go through in the morning. I think that when your free will is operating at a, at a high ebb, it's usually because you've got a set of rituals that you live by and you're committed to. So for me, um, that calmness and spirit and then leading all the way down to my body. It's all, all very, very important stuff. And the truth is I'm most driven by this purpose to, to bring people together and thrill them. So I know I have to stay healthy and I have to stay energetic. And, and uh, in my down moments, it would be because I violated a ritual and or uh, enough diversity hit me that it just wasn't ready, you know, to, to bring it. And that, that's what I work on all the time. Right on. And you're a big rower, right? Yeah, oh God, <laughs> I'm, a rowing. I'm addicted to rowing. <laughs> I totally, I started that like uh, almost 20 years ago with a concept to row, and I've never been gotten off it. It's great. Yeah, that's so awesome. Uh, Dennis and I both share that concept too. Although I think you're hitting it hard. I had a pretty good workout today, actually. What's your most recent workout on that thing? Okay, so I um, I I do it basically same as you every day. So I'll I'll hit a the, the, an elliptical that we have for about 20 minutes, and I get on the rower for for almost almost 40 minutes. So it's an hour in total. I kind of hit that every day. So I hit that this morning, and then go through. I can't do <laughs> for the life of me. I can't do 100 perfect burpees, and certainly couldn't do 300. <laughs> but uh, but I just do a, a lot of um, I do some light lifting and and um, planks. You know, usually every day and. That's kept the, this old man at 56, you know, pretty healthy. Right on. How much? How many meters are you rowing in 40 minutes? Um, I, I, I literally go um, just about 8,000 meters. So um, I get, move at a pretty good crack, and I like to keep, you know, my, I have a sort of a low resting heart rate, so I have to work pretty hard to keep it up high. Yep. And, um so I, I just love it. It's just so full body. It's it's awesome. Do, do the math on that for me. I'm sorry if you're not a rowing geek right now, but do the math on that. What's the pace on that? 500? Is that? Man, yeah, two? that's right. Yeah. Yep. You're doing two? Yep. So you're rowing for 40 minutes at a two-minute pace. Is that right? Yeah, I just, I, I crush that thing. That I is, just, I mean, <laughs> that is yeah. crushing. Just to be really clear, Dennis is hitting it hard for, uh, for the 40 minutes. That's awesome. You do that every day, basically? I, yeah, I do it every day. I've got friends that say, you know, you're you're, you're foolish to work out, work that hard. But I just everybody has different chemistry. That yeah. I, I I need to exercise. If I'm not doing that, I'm in big trouble. Well, this is cool because one of the things we talk about, as you know, uh, is that number one self care habit, right? And Michelle Seeger, yeah. who's actually really close to you at the University of Michigan, one of the world's leading uh, scientists talking about the the science of motivation behavior for health behaviors. Um, says we got to know that number one thing. So it sounds like that exercise is your number one thing. And I just want to shine a spotlight of awesome on you. 8,000 meters a day. I, I rode a million meters a few years ago, and I thought that was pretty cool, which was averaging, wow. you know, no, but you're, you're yeah. rowing 2 million yeah, meters. Yeah, if I go way past that, yeah. You're, you're <laughs> making me look like I was, I don't know what I was doing, going to the kiddie park for a little... Little uh, baby swing or something. That's awesome. That's you're, you're, now you're gonna get. Now you're gonna get me thinking about. It. I'm not gonna be able to do it anymore. That really steps up my uh, my standards. I appreciate the inspiration. Uh, I appreciate you, and I want to. I want to end this chat with one more question, and then also see if we can point people to, to learn more about you. Um, but I like to end these chats with the the question of if you could share one piece of wisdom with people passionate about optimizing their lives, what would that one piece of wisdom be? I, I think aspire to leap. Aspire to love, be enthusiastic, appreciative, and playful and or peaceful. That's my one main piece of advice. I think it's so critical. Um, 
and I get conflicted with all the things, but that to me is more of an original thought. Um, I was extremely, extremely inspired when you talked about identity uh, needs to per- proceed your action and that will lead to your feelings. I think that's huge in terms of living your life. Uh, probably bigger than my idea of leap, but I feel like if you do things from a place of love and enthusiasm, appreciation and peace, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. That is amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, your leadership and your embodiment of these ideas. Um, I know you're really focused on leading your organization, but is there anywhere that people listening to this can go to find more about you? Well, you know, I really don't do, um, the, the only place would be like our website at pistons.com and into our Google search, you know, just some of the articles. I don't do any social media because I feel that if I did that, I, 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 I would have to be committed to it and we have to be committed to, to our fans. And I didn't feel like I could appropriate, appropriately deliver in any medium. Hmm. So, um, I pretty much have been relegated to doing a little two minute features now and then on our, on our, uh, Pistons programming network, but, uh, Probably the best place is just on the on the website. Awesome, and we'll keep track. It was awesome to watch the Pistons excel this year. Such a young team, and um, and again, that is just another demonstration of your humility and your willingness to be behind the scenes and and really just thrill people from behind and, and elevate others. So um, I admire you. I'm inspired by you, and um, appreciate you. So thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hi, this is Brian. A lot of people don't know all the stuff I do beyond these free videos I share on YouTube, so I thought I'd do a quick video to give you an overview of our membership program that you can get access to and get a ton of other stuff. Uh, So here's a quick look. 10 bucks a month, join the Optimal Living membership program. You get instant access to 250 philosopher's notes on some of the best Optimal Living books out there. Old school classics, positive psychology, modern stuff, mindfulness, peak performance, purpose, neuroscience, wealth, etc. And what you may not know is that in addition to the PNTV episodes, I create PDFs on all these great books. So six-page PDFs. Let's take a look at one of them. Joseph Campbell, you want to figure out how to live your hero's journey. Well, this is a great place to start. I basically pull out my favorite big ideas, riff on them, connect them to other books and other ideas, and help you apply this wisdom to your life today. That's what the PDF looks like. Again, we have 250 of these on all these different great books. And then I record those PDFs as an MP3. So you can listen to that MP3 while you're on a walk or working out or doing some errands or whatever. Um, That is Philosopher's Notes. Uh, A lot going on there. And then in addition to Philosopher's Notes, you get access to Optimal Living classes, Optimal Living 101. Idea here is that all those great teachers come back to the same big ideas again and again and again. I distill those ideas into classes. Super practical, fun, inspiring classes, ranging from Habits 101, Confidence 101, Getting Stuff Done 101, Meditation 101, instant access to all those classes. And then future classes include Relationships 101, Energy 101, Purpose 101, Business, Goals, etc. Those are our full-length classes. And then I create micro classes, two to three to five minute little bursts of wisdom on my favorite great ideas from these great books across the domains that you want to optimize in your life. So we have dozens of these so far. I create 50 new micro classes every month and 10 new philosopher's notes every month for 10 bucks a month. So we're blessed to have thousands of members who are uh, enjoying the program and sharing some incredibly kind words with us. And uh, super simple, 10 bucks a month, cancel any time. We'd be honored to be a bigger part of your life. And I appreciate your support. And uh, here's to optimizing and actualizing.